was just trying to work out how long ago it was since I was in Toronto. It must be about 20 years ago. Um, I know I don't look that age. Um, but uh, last time I was here, I saw witness a fantastic thunder and lightning storm. And here I am today in pretty good downpour as well. So I have a particular view about the weather in Toronto. Yeah, exactly. Um, just before um, I start, I'm just going to take a, a little quick uh, straw poll. Can I just hands up those people who um, have got uh, a background in, in one of the health professions, either nurse, medicine, or what have you? So a fair smattering of people. Okay, thank you. Um, and can I just check? I, I understand in Canada that you have a very similar phenomenon that we have in the UK called winter pressures where you get to see um, a lot of added pressure, uh, particularly around emergency demand. So can I just check how many people here think that this winter is going to be either the same or better than last winter? No. Uh, that's yeah, a bit of optimism bias over there in the corner. How many people think it's going to be a bit worse than last winter? Yeah, there's a few people. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll uh, come back to that point uh, at some point uh, during my presentation, but um, it is, it's uh, an interesting um, phenomenon around how most Western health services um, do have obviously a lot more pressure on their hospital services in winter. Although, having said that, Mark has made me feel an awful lot better uh, because he talked about uh, you know, patients in the emergency department of up to 100 hours um, currently our performance, we, as, as you heard before, previous speaker, we have a national target of 95% of every patient who presents in an uh, emergency room has to be seen, treated and or discharged within four hours. And our current trust we deliver about 93%, so just a little bit below the, um, the national uh, target. And the longest wait anyone has ever waited uh, in our A&E &A department has been 11 hours. So um, I feel really good after listening to Mark. It's really spurred me on. <laughs> so thank you, Mark. So um, a little bit of the agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some context stuff. I'm not going to talk about what is CUR, because you all know, but just there's just one or two points from my perspective that I wanted to highlight. A little bit about baselining um, in terms of uh, my own um, organisation. Um, and, and then also a little bit about how I believe so I can help more of a wider local health uh, and social care system um, approach. Um, a couple of other thoughts about things to consider um, and a few um, other next steps. So this is us, uh, well at least some of us anyway. Um, I'm somewhere at the back, uh, my chief exec somewhere at the front uh, and uh, this photo was taken um, a few months ago when we were finally completely free of any regulatory um, intervention. Um, the organisation was put into um, special measures around two and a half, three years ago because of mortality rates. Um, we were one of the first trusts um, to be put into special measures under a new regulatory regime and the first organisation to come back out of special measures. Um, so we've gone from having one of the, I think, from memory, the second highest mortality uh, in England to now actually the second lowest um, in the country. So a very good um, journey um, that we've had. A lot of it is around, apart from obviously cleaning up your data and getting your coding right, a lot of it is also around leadership and culture, which is a point that I'll um, continue to come back to. So um, a lot of... Uh, my colleagues from South Tees, we're a very similar trust in terms of uh, we have a district general hospital function, um, but we also have some tertiary services as well. Um, the turnover of the organisation is around 300 million, four and a half, it's about four and a half thousand staff. Our district general hospital services uh, service a population of just over half a million, and our tertiary service around one and a half million um, population. Um, in the new regulatory regime, we've now been rated good for the second um, successive year. Um, again, we're one of, um, I think, the top quartile in terms of trust nationally. Uh, and generally speaking, we hit all the key access targets around the four hour a &E target, maximum weight of 18 weeks uh, for elective care from referral to treatment um, and cancer targets, as well as diagnostic uh, imaging weights. We have seen some significant increases in emergency demand. Last year, compared to the year before, uh, we saw a 22% increase in attendances to our A&E. We 
are now seeing between 120 and 130,000 attendances a year, um, and uh, they convert into an 11% increase um, in admissions. That's clearly growth that's uh, not particularly sustainable. Uh, we knew that we were a bit of an outlier around some of our length of stay, again, some of our non-elective length of stay in general medicine, care of the elderly, uh, and a couple of HRGs and respiratory, particularly COPD. Um, and in that context, um, there was also a, an order that was commissioned a couple of years ago looking at readmissions. Uh, readmissions cost the NHS nationally around two and a half billion pounds um, uh, each year. So there is quite a uh, sizable prize there to go at in terms of what else can we do nationally around reducing the number of readmissions and getting the discharge right the first time. Um, that led to us locally in terms of having some better communication, some better uh, dialogue, engagement with other local system partners, um, much better in, interagency working and certainly good improvement. So there's a lovely graph around what emergency attendances are doing. It's a little bit scary. Um, we uh, had uh, a capital build or an extension to our A&E department uh, that was completed nearly three years ago now, and we've already outstripped um, that uh, growth on that department. So we've got to do something different because we cannot just keep building uh, bigger and bigger A&E departments. So, last winter, wow, that was an interesting one. Um, so we had a very challenging winter, um, and partly on uh, some of the um, history before last winter, but also the fact that nationally, everyone was having a particularly uh, very challenging time. It was the first time nationally that the four-hour target was missed. Um, and there was quite ingre uh, increasing political pressure um, around that because actually what everyone thinks, there is something fundamental about that four-hour standard. Um, and I know sitting in an A&E waiting room with a friend of mine for four hours, that seemed like an eternity. It is an awful long time. So I think it's absolutely right and proper that we are looking at how we can improve patient flow both at the front end and at the back end. So commissioned a couple of reviews. reviews. One was looking at our front door processes, um, and that was particularly looking uh, at what are the bottlenecks and what are some of the quick wins that we could make, uh, and also a review of the back door processes, again to look at what are the opportunities uh, around that. Um, we also had a, a regional uh, review that was conducted around the number of ambulances that were being conveyed to two local hospitals, uh, and that showed that around about nearly 40% of all ambulance conveyances did not need to go to an acute hospital. That's not to say those patients didn't have any need, um, that sometimes those other services were in place and sometimes that they weren't, but again, that's a lot of ambulance activity that could be redirected elsewhere. Locally, we've got a bit of a crowd to provide a market, so there's quite a lot of fragmentation of particularly community and mental health services uh, and social care services. Uh, and on the back of that, there was also joint commitment uh, along what's called our system resilience group to look at uh, how we could actually improve things. Um, we were also one of the successful applications. It's a bit like uh, my colleagues from South Tees. It was very last minute. We threw in an application before someone else went on leave. Um, and uh, we were successful, which was fab. So, um, a couple of interesting things. In, the, in England, it's been national policy since 2006. And I was thinking about what, what was I doing in 2006. And I was an executive director of a strategic health authority which should have been absolutely aware of all the national policy and looking to see how they could have implemented it, but for some reason it completely bypassed us. But there's a real opportunity and a real drive and a, and a growing momentum, I think, nationally to really look at how we can make the most uh, of the opportunities that CUR presents. Um, the, one of the points I wanted to make, and I'll talk a little bit about the um, audit that we conducted with um, MedWorks earlier on in the year, but it's the last point that I'm particularly interested in because I think it is a mechanism where it can help facilitate ensuring that in the local health and social care system that actually you manage the available capacity correctly. So typically, if you get the patients in the right place the first time, I don't need the number of inpatient adult beds that I've got. I am overbedded. Um, and that's quite controversial talking to some of my clinical colleagues within the trust.
but there is more work we need to do downstream. So there is more work we need to do around making sure those patients who are in community settings are also the most appropriate patients in the community setting and so on. Um, talking to a colleague in, a, in another hospital um, in the middle of the country uh, where they had opened uh, two brand new wards um, last winter, uh, they were struggling with their four hour target and they opened these two wards and thought this is great, this is going to fix the problem and guess what happened? It sorted the problem for about one month and then after a month they started there before it's deteriorating because there's a fundamental law of healthcare provision and you will just naturally fill to the capacity you've got and if you don't change anything else uh, into it, in terms of those end-to-end -end processes and pathways you'll just be back to square one. Uh, and I think there's quite a bit of stuff in the literature that uh, reinforces that point as well. So again, um, concern last winter, I've talked about um, some of the uh, uh, work that we had done to better understand what some of our issues were uh, and in terms, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about um, the MedWorks um, audit. We also looked at some other data. So we had undertaken an HRG level analysis of those specialties that we knew we were a particular outlier on. So we knew, we knew that for general medicine, um, we uh, stood out like a sore thumb in terms of having a long length of stay. And we wanted to better understand that and better understand exactly what were the specific patient pathways that clearly weren't working as well as what they should. Um, and then we also looked uh, at that ambulance report um, and also looked at what else was in the literature currently uh, around this area to see what was some of the more recent published research um, around um, this area. One interesting article um, I came across was um, about some of the workforce elements which uh, reviewed uh, and um, uh, it was a meta-analysis that was uh, conducted by the Cochrane Institution in Australia who looked at the benefits or otherwise of having GPs based in an ED department um, and interestingly there is no evidence that supports any improvement that that does um, which I found quite interesting because I have a lot of pressure from our, our commissioners, our funders to increase the number of GPs in ED thinking that would solve the problem but the evidence does not suggest that. So what were some of the key findings? Oops, can't do that. So I've talked about um, the 39, 40% of ambulances. We did have some uh, delays in getting patients to imaging. The delay wasn't so much within the imaging department. Uh, we had already done quite a lot of improvement work with our imaging service uh, and set some internal metrics uh, around things like uh, turnaround times from referral to report. Um, but actually, the simple thing of getting the patient from ED to imaging, which often came down to the poor old porter, um, was one of the big blocks that we had. We also had um, what's commonly talked about in terms of exit block. So getting patients out of our emergency department, um, particularly into medical beds, was a problem. And those beds came up at the wrong time of day. Um, so I know that by midnight, every patient who needs to be admitted does eventually get to a bed. But it's taken too long to get that patient to the right bed. It's taken us all day. And those patients have had a pretty awful experience hanging around waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, so we have, um, uh, again, Julie talked about the 25% uh, of discharges by midday. I've converted that into something uh, for us locally, which hopefully makes a bit more sense for people. So we have 11 by 11. So I know that if I have 11 discharges from my base wards, so that's not including my assessment units, from my base wards by 11 a.m., actually I'm going to have pretty good flow, much better flow. So the rhetoric now within the organisation is about 11 by 11. Before you ask the question, are we achieving it? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> but the interesting thing is it's galvanised people and people understand they're talking about it now. We've, we've um, presented the data back to people. Um, we've started doing some more intensive work on a, we're doing, we're doing three wards at a time, so we've had the first three wards, we're about to start with the second three wards to really understand what is it that's going to need to change or what, what's it going to take to be able to improve um, some of that performance. And 11 discharges by 11am seems very doable. 
Um, so there was also something about translating that in, in a way that people could understand and feel like it was achievable. Um, and I've talked about the bed availability. So this is where it gets really interesting. If, if I think back, I'm, I managed to get some uh, non-recurring funding uh, back last winter out of what's called resilience funding, which I have to say is all gone now, it's all a thing of the past. But I managed to get some funding to uh, commission Meadworks to come in and, and do uh, this audit, which here you call a PT. Yes, that's it, yeah. Um, and before Meadworks came in and did this, if I listened to some of the conversations within our organisation, it would have gone along the lines of, well, we're all right, it's all the amount there. You know, all our delays are with community services or with social care or with patients themselves. Uh, and actually, we think we're doing pretty well. And that would be the sort of rhetoric. So what we wanted to do was we commissioned a couple of hundred of these are non-elective patients, so we excluded elective patients because they're, they're a much better understood cohort of patients. Uh, and we skewed it to medicine, where we knew some of the biggest challenges were. We reviewed those patient pathways across 11 different wards. And there was very clear evidence of avoidable, um, some avoidable missions, uh, and also we quantified some of the excess bed days, so patients that were waiting longer um, than what they should have done for their particular condition. Um, 25, or just over 25%, um, were avoidable bed days um, and uh, by 84 patients needing a less intensive care setting. Now if I had 84 fewer patients in, in uh, my hospital, A, I'd have happier patients uh, because it would feel less frenetic anyway and more controlled, but boy, I'd have happier staff. Uh, so that is certainly for me, it qu started quantifying um, some of the size of the prize that, that was potentially there. Um, perhaps one of the good things was that we only discovered six patients that actually never uh, met the criteria, which James from Midworks tells me that compared to some of the other audits they've done, is certainly on the lower side. Um, so that meant that our, our threshold for emission was there or thereabouts, was pretty good. So it wasn't so much a front door issue, it was absolutely about how we're helping patients through their pathway and getting them safely and effectively discharged. And then typically with um, this sort of audit, we, uh, we categorised um, some of those um, avoidable bed days by the same categories um, that we heard this morning. Now, before we shared these results um, with our staff, and there were quite a lot of clinical staff, nurses and doctors and therapists in particular, they already had a perception about what sort of percentage would fall into each of those three uh, groups. That would be fair to say, wouldn't it? <laughs> Um, and they were a bit shot. So internal reasons accounted for nearly three quarters um, with uh, physician delays um, and hospital delays being the biggest. Uh, and the external community health related reasons accounted for only just over a quarter. And you can imagine the reaction we got. We went through a whole phase of the data must be wrong or you've not understood or you didn't understand the notes correctly or whatever. And it really is like a grieving cycle. So I did hear clinical staff go through that denial phase uh, and, and then they got a bit angry. Then they tried to start bargaining with the, then they got a bit depressed because they were starting to realize, oh shit. Um, and, uh, and I think they now sort of got to the acceptance stage where they recognize that actually the data is the data and you can, you can argue around the fringes, but really it does highlight what's, what the issues were. Um, not too dissimilar to uh, most hospitals, uh, certainly in the UK setting, flow processes were somewhat manual, subjective, and in silos. Uh, and despite um, a, a multi-billion pound national IT <laughs> program that we had um, all through um, the noughties, it's been an unmitigated disaster uh, and we have still uh, got a long way to go in terms of getting some of our IT systems better integrated, talking to each other, 
better functional EPR systems uh, and making it easier for frontline staff to be able to A, capture the data and use the data. Uh, interestingly, I was watching a um, senior registrar in uh, general medicine uh, on a ward a few weeks ago logging into systems. Now, he logged on to six different systems to get different results around the patient. It took him ages. And I just thought we are not making this easy for staff. And if we really want to try and get them better engaged, um, then we've really got to look at how we sort that. So that's, that's another project. Um, and there was definitely a need uh, to have a lot greater transparency um, around the whole way in which patient flow structure um, in the local system worked. Our system resilience group is made up of all the local health providers, so the acute trust, the mental health provider, the community services provider, the local hospice, social care services, um, the funder, um, ambulance service, etc. Previously, those meetings were a bit of a love -in. So we had a meeting every fortnight on a Friday and we were awfully polite to each other um, and we wouldn't dare criticise um, each other. But what some of the state has started doing is changing the dialogue uh, and we definitely started being able to use some uh, more informed case studies. Uh, we were able to really start to hold each other to account a lot better. So if there was a, 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 a part of someone's pathway that fell down or wasn't as good as what it should be, actually we would really have some pretty rigorous um, and uh, energetic uh, discussion around that. And that continues to grow. So we're, we're much better now at holding each other to account than what we, what we were. And typically previously, it was all the acute trust. It was all A&E. &E, um, and that was the, uh, the nature of the conversation. Again, that's changed an awful lot. So here we go. Um, so of those 199 patients that were assessed, that shows you um, exactly um, some of the uh, results in terms of the uh, RFD days. Um, again, graphically by uh, reason. That shows you again in terms of the bigger issues were internal. Uh, and that was a real shock for particularly our medical staff uh, who um, really grappled uh, to understand and, and accept that there was a lot more improvement work that we knew that we could make internally uh, and control some of our um, improvement destiny. Um, so of the physician-related uh, delays, um, 40 days were attributed, which is the um, biggest single category, to a waiting consultation with a medical team. So whereas I was being told every day that yes, every patient has been reviewed by a consultant, actually there were still delays um, happening and uh, that's led to quite a few changes in terms of the way in which our medical teams structure themselves, the way they work. Um, the start time of our junior medical staff has changed, we move, they start much earlier in the day now, um, etc. So a lot of the patients um, in the wards were undergoing therapy and this really upset the physiotherapists because therapy is quite a, it's a, a more generic uh, term and the physiotherapists got very exercised by this um, and they definitely went through the grieving cycle. Um, <laughs> bless them. Um, but the key message was a lot of that um, intervention could have been delivered at a lower level of care. One of the other interesting cultural things that we've got in our organisation is that the level of acceptance. So often I'd hear the conversations of the ward where it might be a care home saying that, yes, we'll come back and, and review Gladys to take them back uh, and we'll be there sometime next week to do that. And the ward say, oh, OK, thank you. Not a good enough, not acceptable. There is not acting in the best interest of that patient. So they're getting much better and more confident be able to say, no, you need to get here today or, or certainly by tomorrow. Uh, and, and that's having some interesting effect as well. Um, the highest community delay uh, was with social services. Um, and it's interesting in, in Wales, uh, in the United Kingdom, they are now looking at, at fully integrating health with social care uh, and looking at fully integrated uh, provider organisations across both. I'm really interested to see 
what change that makes to the dynamic because we are still often some interesting dialogue between health and social care and there's the patient stuck in the middle of that. Uh, and we've got to be able to transcend that. Uh, again, that was social services. And then we also looked um, at, of those delays in, in social care, we looked at um, the postcode um, analysis. And that showed in one particular postcode uh, accounted for a fair uh, proportion of those delays. Now, no surprise in that particular postcode um, is on our border. So it borders with another trust that's in London, in North London. Uh, and so for me, though, that's, that's been an interesting topic of conversation I've had with that neighbouring trust. Uh, but also simple things like clarifying the, um, the geographical boundaries. Um, I discovered that the ambulance service were using a, a, a map um, that was about 20 years old, literally. Um, and I don't know how many times the NHS is restructured at that time. So there were lots of simple little things uh, that actually tidied up some of that information and some of that data that people were using. So, some of the benefits. It certainly is an extremely helpful tool to make some of the data an awful lot more transparent um, and uh, definitely, I think, is altering our understanding of where some of the pressure points are in the whole wider health social care system uh, for us locally. So we know, for example, feeding back um, both our audits uh, that we did back in February, uh, but also some of the work we've been doing since in, in terms of the, um, the start of our rollout, um, is really understanding where some of those pressure points are. We know, for example, that in terms of the care home sector, partly because of some national policy issues um, and raising the national minimum wage, for example, which has added another billion pounds to the cost for the national care home sector, there are providers that are exiting the market. So if you have care homes exited the market, that creates some capacity constraint. Um, so there is that law of unintended consequences. But I think what we're able to do now is really understand that a lot better and understand the, the implications of that much sooner. Um, it definitely has provided an extremely helpful catalyst to alter the dialogue. Um, and it, it's really interesting when uh, the conversations that, that we used to have with clinicians, in some cases still do, but we are transitioning, um, the number of times we would ask the poor consultant on the ward, how many discharges have you got today? No, 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 we need at least another you know, couple of discharges from your ward. It completely turns them off. Um, and I absolutely understand that. So I think this CUI has been an extremely useful tool to completely change the language, completely change the dialogue and the nature of that dialogue um, and really look at uh, how we can make sure that the most appropriate patients are indeed in the most appropriate bed. We've also been using it to look at how different specialties respond to pressure. So I think Mark talked this morning about um, the patients in A&E who are waiting there longer are actually being managed by the relevant um, uh, bed holding specialty. Uh, so they're still following a, a, an inpatient pathway, if you like. So what we've been doing is working with each specialty and saying, okay, when you do have, when we do experience high volume or some additional capacity pressure, what is it that you're going to do differently? Because actually we need a differential response from you as a specialty uh, in, in those times of increased pressure. So what is it you're going to do? What's your plan? Whereas previously you, we used to have a pretty generic hospital-wide surge plan, which was fairly meaningless for the individual respiratory uh, consultant, for example. Uh, and I think that, again, has been quite useful in terms of changing that sort of conversation and dialogue uh, at specialty level. Um, and I think it's also been useful in terms of really critically looking at how we use resources across the whole system. So again, previously, um, we're very siloed. So the hospital resources were the hospital resources, the community resources were the community resources. But actually now we're starting to talk a lot better about what's the total resource look like for all of us? And how do we play that better into the system for the benefit of everyone? Um, Certainly a useful monitoring tool. We've um, developed a local system-wide dashboard. Um, previously, it was all about A&E, and it was all about that four-hour target, um, and it was all about the pressures in the hospital. Um, we've moved away from that. In fact, my colleagues from South Tees will be pleased to know that the number of metrics from 
the acute hospital is the fewest. Actually, there's an awful lot of measures now across the wider health and social care system. So for the first time, I've got a much better sight of where the different pressure points are, what the available capacity is wherever um, in the system. Uh, and again, I think uh, the CUR tool has been extremely helpful for us to be absolutely clear about what our particular uh, performance is looking like. And I've talked about how it engages clinicians differently. So a couple of other things I thought I'd briefly talk about after the metrics. Um, we've been really clear that we want to make sure that we project manage the implementation of CUR. One of the awful things we do in the NHS, I don't know whether it's different in Canada, but we often ask people to do stuff on top of their day job. Um, and we don't always make the time, resources, and everything else available to implement something that's quite new, and we're really bad at evaluating. So often in the hospital sector, you implement something, uh, and then you've quickly moved on to the next thing before you've really understood um, the, 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 the benefit or the impact of what it is you've implemented. So we've been um, much more structured in terms of the way in which we're managing this as a project. We've had some other spin-off um, issues and opportunities that have risen out of this. Um, it has been a, uh, enabled us to look at how we engage with our staff generally, not just about CUR, but just generally, how do we engage, particularly with our clinical staff. And it's also led us to really reflect about the roles and how we need to redesign some of those roles, particularly the ward manager. Uh, and Often we were throwing lots of different things at wards, and the nature of the role of the ward manager has changed um, considerably. So we've been looking um, at how we redesign that and support the development of, of that particular role. Uh, and also we've moved to, uh, or moving towards a hospital integrated discharge service and are about to appoint a joint head between uh, the hospital and the community service provider. And that person will be able to use quite specific case studies, to, again, to feed back to the local system. Um, and we've got to get a lot better and do a lot more of how we engage uh, with patients and carers. I'd say particularly carers, because they're often so key and so vital uh, in terms of someone's discharge. A um, couple of comments around organisational culture. So I think CUR is an extremely helpful tool, but it's a tool. And unless you actually really look to see how you can use that tool as part of your organisational culture and, and look at your leadership culture, values and behaviours, um, then you're not going to get the maximum benefit um, out of CUR. So we've been quite clear that actually this is absolutely feeding into some rework we're doing around um, our values and behaviours. Um, and so it doesn't matter whether I'm not there in five years' time or the chief exec's changed or whatever. That actually this starts to become the way in which we do stuff uh, in our organisation and in our local system. And I think to really make sure that it does become embedded, we've got to keep an eye um, to that. So, um, just in summary, whoops, my summary. Um, we want to complete the rollout to our tertiary beds. Unlike South Tees, we've been successful in getting our local um, commissioner support as well, so we're also rolling it out to our uh, non-specialised beds, so all our general medical and surgical beds, uh, and we've got a, we are going to be having a fairly rapid um, rollout. Um, we've been in quite a lot of work with our community service provider who are also keen to implement it, albeit they're really nervous because they know that if actually we get our act together, it really starts putting the focus and the, and the spotlight on them. But they really understand and appreciate the principles and are keen to also uh, implement who are. And I'll talk about the last couple of points. So, I quite like this quote. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that's taking place. Um, and I think there is something about how we can use some of that data uh, and how we can really make sure um, that we're communicating that in a way that is truly um, understood uh, and uh, that we are engaging with our staff in that way. Um, the other quote. Um, is, and this was, I think he's a Danish colorectal surgeon, I just can't quite find his name, so apologies to him. Um, a variation is the enemy of success. There's another part of that quote, which I didn't put up there, which was, um, and descenders will be shot, I think it was, um, which was a bit, a bit too much. But there is something about we are all 
really looking at how we better manage some of that variation. Uh, I mean, again, we saw from Mark some of the uh, how that's been helpful for his organisation in terms of reducing that variation. Uh, and CUR certainly is a tool that I think can really bring that into a sharp spotlight and help reduce some of that variation in a way that cl clinical staff can really understand and relate to. And it's a journey. Um, and it's, all, it's a never-ending journey. So don't think for one minute that once you've done it, you've done it. Um, because it is uh, a journey, but an exciting one at that. Whoops. And I think that's it. Yep. That's us again. There's a bit of a Hawthorne effect um, as well. So as we start to roll out CUR, there's more and more staff that are actually a understanding what it's about, but also can see what some of the benefits are. So even before it hits a ward, they're already talking about it and therefore already starting to think about what does it mean for them on their ward. So there's an element of Hawthorne um, effect. But do we still get surges? Yes. Uh, last week we had uh, 15 ambulances turn up within 20 minutes. Now, no planning in the world, um, you're going to be able to manage that uh, you know, in, a, uh, in the way that you'd like to. So you're still going to get times when that's going to happen. The trick is about making sure that you've got those sort of systems and processes in line so that all lined up, so that everyone who needs to know does know in real time and can respond. Uh, and I think that's the trick. So I don't for one minute think this is going to completely um, sort out any surge challenges, but it, it should start reducing the range. You know, I had a great uh, moment while you were giving your talk, um, and it, it, I, I think it came out in the data. I, you know, have been practiced as a physician for 25 years, and I'm trying to manage physicians, which is like freaking cats. Um, I don't think I've ever had a tool where we're giving feedback to physicians as part of a team, where their performance is my performance, is operations performance and that it's in the context of the team. Usually we give physician performance in a very siloed way. And so, I, you know, I think that when we had our PTR, we had the same experience. The docs were there and they're like, oh, okay, you're bad, but so am I. Um, or you're good, so am I. Um, but I, I think that's, you know, valuable and it was an aha moment while you were giving your presentation. And I had an aha moment this morning about EDDs, so that's got me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't <do> it, thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Do we exist a coach? Do we find a specific provision in Yeah, uh, yes. What, what we, um, but we are quite late in terms of doing it, uh, and we're still refining it as well. So, it, and it really struck me when my, my chief exec got asked to. Um, to talk briefly on CUR at a, at a chief ex, regional chief exec meeting, and she said, I'm quite sure I actually really understand it. Can you brief me? And I thought, oh, God. So we've, we've really started uh, sort of winding back a bit and thinking about actually who are all the stakeholders um, and, and how are we going to communicate some of this stuff to them. And partly on that stakeholder analysis, that's when we realised that actually communication with patients and carers, we hadn't done nearly enough of, and we still haven't done enough um, of that. So that was a bit of a gap, big gap that we had. Well, you're letting me off lightly. 